Now, what we were working on last time was parameterized queries. And the notion of a parameterized query is, is straightforward. All right? It's where you have a SQL statement that has a blank that gets filled in at some point. All right? That gets filled in specifically at runtime. By runtime, I mean not when you compile the program, not when you go out and publish the website, but when a user is actually running the program and enter data on a form or click on a link or something like that. And in a nutshell, a parameterized query is a query where there is a blank in the query. So, for example, let's say I was searching uh, through the questions that are in my poll database. Let's say I only wanted questions that were about basketball, all right, because I'm a sports fan, basketball is my favorite sport, so I'm not interested in anything else. So I'm going to look for any, any questions that have basketball in the title, for, for example. A query might look like this. Select star from poll where question text like
that corresponded to the question. All right. In order to do that, this page has to tell this page what question we were interested in. Now, one thing that I, I say in some of my classes, I might have said it in this class. If not, this will be the first time, and I'll, I'm sure I'll repeat it, is HTTP is a stateless protocol. What does a stateless protocol mean? It means it's up in Canada, where they don't have states, they have provinces? What does a stateless protocol mean? I don't expect you to know this, by the way, but if you have an idea, go ahead. You don't necessarily always have to put it in to get to where you have to go. You don't necessarily always have to put in to get to where you have to go. That is, um, that, that is, that is in essence, the right answer. All right? That's, that's leading towards the right answer. Let's put it this way. In HTTP, each request is a brand new request that's not associated with any other request. That is according to the protocol. HTTP is a protocol. What's a protocol? A protocol is a way that two entities communicate. So there's a lot of protocols in IT because Obviously, for every machine in the world to be able to connect to the web, they all have to be following a consistent set of rules, right? You couldn't have machines over here doing one thing, machines over there doing something else. So there's a protocol defined, all right? And the HTTP protocol is a protocol for requesting web pages. Now, there's nothing on the, in the protocol that connects two requests together. So if I, t if I go to ESPN.com and then I collect, click on the Cleveland, Cleveland Cavaliers link, those two requests are separate requests according to the protocol. Now, we know in experience that it seems like our requests are connected together. Let me give you a for instance. For instance, when you log into Canvas, you go in the first page and you enter in your user ID and password. After that, you don't have to enter in your user ID and password each time you go to a new page. I think that's what you were getting at. You don't always have to put in uh, your credentials or say what you're searching for or whatever. All right? So somehow, somehow, those requests are connected. But they're not connected through the protocol. Well... How are they connected? There's a number of different techniques to connect requests together so that one page knows what happened on an earlier page. And in this case here, we have a SQL statement that says select star from poll. And then we have a SQL statement here that says select, or select star from answer. where poll ID equals a blank. And how is that blank going to get filled in? It's going to get filled in with the ID of the thing that we clicked on. And we're going to pass that ID as part of the query string. So the query string is one way that a web application can maintain state. So when you think of state, state is close to the word status. So think of status as like what has happened before. So there's ways for the, for the web application to remember who is logged on. So you're not asked for your user ID and password on every page. There's ways for the web server to pass from this page to that page what question we clicked on. And this is the first technique with the, that we're learning, and it is via a query string. So the query string is appended to the URL, and it starts with a question mark. It then has one or more
four fields that consist of the name of the field, an equal sign, and a value. If there are more fields, you're going to get an ampersand. And again, another field that consists of a name of the field and a value. How many fields do you pass from page one to page two? As many as you need. Now in this case, we want to pull all the questions, or I'm sorry, all the answers associated with this question. In order to do that, we only need to pass the poll ID because that's the foreign key between these two tables. That's what links the answer to the question. So, we do this in two steps. It's like we have a pitcher and a catcher, to continue the baseball analogy. It's great to be able to, to talk about baseball this late in the year, right, and not be totally irrelevant, all right, here in the Cleveland area, all right? Usually by now, people uh, are have forgotten about the Indians and are, I was going to say, and are, and are worried about the Browns, but lately, at this point in the year, people have forgotten about the Browns, too, and have moved on to the Cavaliers. <laughs> Again. All right. But at any rate, um, you have a pitcher and a catcher. This page has to throw the data to this page, and then this page has to do something with it. Now, how is that going to work? Well, we're going to make a link that's going to be partly hard-coded and partly coming from data. So what's the hard-coded part of this link? The hard-coded par hard part of this link is this. That's the hard-coded part of the link, assuming that the page is answer.aspx. I forgot what I called it last time, All right, so we'll have to look that up. But this is the part of the link that's going to be hard-coded. This is, but after the equal sign, there's going to be a piece that gets filled in at runtime. All right? And what is that going to correspond to? That's going to correspond to a data field. We want this to be the field from the database for the poll ID. So whatever the value of the poll ID is, we're going to put it here. Because that's what we need to pull up all the answers. We need the poll ID. So this is a picture. This is throwing the ID over to this page. This page is a catcher. All right. So how does this page catch it? Well, it needs to look on the query string, and it needs to call the field by the same name as the pitcher did. All right. So this page needs to look for the thing on the query string called ID. Doesn't matter what the name we give it is. It just has to match up between these two. We could call it Fred on this page. As long as this one was looking for Fred, then everything would be okay. So it doesn't really matter what the name of the field is. What matters is, is that it's consistent between the pitcher and the catcher. They're, they're, they're talking the same language here. When we pull that value from the query string, that's what we're going to put in to all the blanks that we have on this page. All right? That's what we're going to put in to the blanks on this page. So let's look at the example we had from last time. Because I kind of wrapped up that example quick. And I want to take a little bit more time reviewing it today.
Зачем? So let's run this and let's look at the behavior and then we'll look at the code so that we're clear on the way this works. And I'm going to set default 2 as my start page. So if I remember I had problems with default because of the master page, which I have not looked up to identify what was wrong with that. So we'll set default 2 as my start page. So I fired up, default 2 is going to have a list of all of the questions. Here's a list of questions. Remember again, and I've said this before, sometimes it's useful to look at the source that gets generated. Because remember, the ASP.NET controls, in this case we have a grid view and a SQL view and all that, they get run on the server and they create HTML. Web pages are HTML, right? Doesn't matter how they're created. In static web pages, we, we just write the HTML. In the case of dynamic pages, typically we write some mix of plain old HTML and some server-side code. And the server-side code runs and creates more HTML. So let's look at the source that gets created here. All right. I'm specifically interested in this is a grid view, right? It's a table. Doesn't look like I can make it bigger. But I'm particularly interested in a link because poll and answer dot ASPX question mark ID equals one. Poll and answers dot ASPX ID equals two. All right. So this is a picture, right? It's getting ready to throw that ID over to the second page. And part of the URL is fixed, doesn't change. The part up to and including the equal sign. That's the same for every row. If we had a billion rows, they would all start out polls and answers, poll and answers dot ASPX question mark ID equals and then followed by the value of the ID. When we click on this, we get the information related to that particular poll. We get the question and we get the answers. Let's 
just look at the URL, and I'm going to pop this URL into Word so that we can expand it. So just as we saw when we viewed the source of the other page, that's the page that gets called. Pull and answers dot ASPX question mark ID equals followed by the ID. So this page is a catcher. This page's job is to pluck that value off of the query string and use it in the queries. Fill in the blanks in those queries. All right. And it's going to do that for two different queries. It's going to do that for this query that shows me the poll information and this query that pulls out the valid answers for that poll. So again, notice poll ID equals one. That matched what was on the query string. So it did its job right. All right, let's look at the code that does this. And we can look at this in design view, where we look at a visual representation of these components. We can also look at it in, in the in, look at the actual code itself. So let's start by looking at it in design view, and then we'll look at the code itself. I think it's important to view, be able to view in both modes. Sometimes the user interface sort of hides details from you or makes it difficult to find some details, where if you look at the code, you can see everything. You can see literally what's going to get executed. Here is our SQL data source. It's thinking about if it wants to show it to me. It decided it was okay. And we can configure it. We use this connection string, and it's important, again, just to make sure that you have one connection string that you always use, and that you use it from the web config file, so that if you change something about the database, like what it's called, where it's located, um, the database engine that you're using, you only need to make the change in one place. Our SQL statement is simply select star from poll, uh, select star from poll, order by date expired. So we're selecting everything from the poll. Remember, this is the first page, all right? And the first page has a listing of everything on it, all right? First page has a listing of everything on it. So there is no where clause, all right? A where clause limits a query to only show certain items. So here's the columns that we're going to show. And we're showing everything. That's what the star means. We're showing every column. Because we don't have a where clause, we're showing every row also. So we're showing every row, every column. In other words, we're showing everything in this database. We then go and we bind our grid view to the data source. Remember, with these database queries, there's always going to be two components. There's going to be the data component, and there's going to be the visual component, and the two are bound together. That just gives you so much more flexibility to be able to change one without worrying about the other one. So you can change the way it looks without worrying about messing up the actual data that you're pulling. We could go in and edit this grid view if we wanted to. Um, but what's of most interest to us is the very first column. Because the first column, if you notice here, is a link. It's not simply text. So let's look at this column. So I'll go into Edit Columns. It's a hyperlink field. If you recall what I did last time, when I created this data grid, it showed up as just a plain old text field. So I deleted the question and created a hyperlink field. 
The properties are important for this. These are the four properties that are important. And let me try... Let me try to turn on a magnifier so that we can see this. Okay, hopefully that's a little easier to read. There are three fields that are relevant. There is the data navigate URL fields. This is the piece of data that we want to include in the URL. This is the data field. Well, what are we passing from page one to page two? We're passing the poll ID. So therefore, we have poll ID listed here. So this is the data that we're going to pass from page one to page two. So what does page two need to do, to do its job? It needs to know the ID of the poll. Normally, if you're clicking on something and you want to go to the one row that matches it, you're going to be passing someone's primary key, right, and someone's foreign key. So in this case, the poll ID is the primary key of the poll table. It is the foreign key in the answer table. So na data navigate URL fields is the data that we're going to pass. So this is the part that's going to be different for every row because every row has its own poll ID. The data navigate URL format tells us where we're going to put that data. And again, we can't see all of this here. I'll try to fix that in a minute. But it says poll and answers ASPX question mark ID equals. That's the part that's fixed. That's the part that's the same in every case. And after the equal sign is curly bracket, zero, curly bracket. And what that relates to is the field from this list. Notice it says data navigate URL fields. So we could pass more than one field from page one to page two. We could, if we wanted to, all right? Some tables have multiple part primary keys, so maybe we need to pass both of them. Or maybe there's another reason that we, we need to pass some data from the first page to the second page. So we can pass a bunch of fields if we want to. This tells us how to format the URL and where we're going to drop in the values from that field. The curly brackets and that include a number correspond to the number of the field that we're going to drop in there. Now, in this case, it's curly bracket zero. Why? Because we only have one field. And again, remembering typically in programming, when you start counting, you start counting with zero. All right? So this is the zeroth field on the list. So... We're going to pop in, right after the equal sign, the value of the poll ID. So that's going to be our link. And when we looked at it, that's what we got, right? When we looked at those URLs, it was polls and answer ASPX dot uh, question mark ID equals 1, ID equals 2, ID equals 3, and so on. Now, what do we want to display as the text of the link? In other words, what are the words that are going to be clicked on? Well, we're going to display the question text. So if you remember, when we clicked on, what the link was actually the words of the question. So that is the text of the link. With the link, you always have at least two things, right? You have... ...users going to click on. And in this case... The, the data that the user is going to click on is coming from a data field, or the, the words that the user is clicking on is coming from a data field. It's coming from question text. And we're not doing any formatting with it here. 
All right, formatting would be as if we want to put a bunch of stuff in before or after it, but that's not really necessary here. So that's the picture. Any questions about this? Creates a link that is partly hard-coded and partly contains a value from the database. Now for the catcher. Pulls and answers. Here's our SQL data source, one. If we configure it, uses the same connection string, which is good, right? We want to, don't want, we don't need a separate connection string for every page. We're always connecting to the same database in this example. So there should only be one connection string. Our SQL statement. Select star from poll, where poll ID equals question mark. That's the parameter. That's the blank space in the query that's going to get filled in. All right? Do we want every poll? No. We only want a certain poll. Which poll do we want? We're going to send it to this page using the poll ID. Now, we have to tell it, though, we have to tell it, though, where that parameter is going to get filled in from. Right? We can't simply say, well, there's a blank space in this query. Where, where are you going to get the value from it? Well, you have to say. So the catcher has to know where it's coming from. And there's a couple of choices, and depending on the particular page that you're talking about, this could be different from page to page. But in our case, this page, the data is being passed to it as part of the query string, right? It was on the link. And what was it called on the query string? It was called ID. So remember, this has to match what was on the other page for the formatting of the URL. So the pitcher and the catcher have to call this field the same thing in order for the catcher to catch it. If it's not called the same thing, then this page isn't going to work. All right, because it's going to be looking for data that isn't there. All right, so this, this name could be anything. It doesn't have to be ID. It could be Fred, as long as the page that creates a URL uses Fred on the query string, and as long as this page expects Fred on the query string. We can test it. And again, because there's only one question that has that ID, I don't really need a grid view, so I'm going to use a detailed view. Detailed views and grid views work very, very similarly. The difference is, is that one shows one row from the database at a time a grid view shows multiple rows from the database. SQL data source 2 is going to be virtually the same, except it is pulling the answers related to this poll. Same thing, though. There's a question mark after poll ID that's going to get filled in from the same place, from the ID in on the query string. Now, because there can be more than one answer for a poll, I'm using a grid view to represent that, because that will show all of them in a table. There's something I was thinking of. Oh, one question that sometimes is puzzling to students is when they see a page to identify 
if you need one data source or two data sources? I think I asked this question last time, and I think I got some people said one, some people said two. And the truth is you could probably figure out a way to do it using both techniques, but I would say two is the better answer in this case. The way I determine whether there's one or two data sources, just verbally describe the data that I want to see. So, for example, on the top of the page, I want to see the text of the question for the ID that I've selected. In the table, in the grid view, I want to see a list of all the answers for the question that I've selected. So my verbal descriptions of those two pieces of data that are going to be on the page are different. One is I want to see the question that I selected. The other is I want to show all the answers for the question that I selected. Those are two different things, and therefore two different things mean two different data sources. All right. If I literally use the exact same explanation to describe two different pieces of data on the page, then it might be one data source. But if the words are different describing the, uh, what's going to be contained for that piece of data, then it's going to be two different data sources. So, we put the ID on the query string under ID, and the second page uses ID to fill in the blanks in the queries to give us the answer that we're looking for. Questions about this? Let's write another kind of parameterized query. All right, let's do sort of the same thing. So my dad would say, we'll do the same thing, but different. All right. Let's write a search so that users can search for polls that might interest them. All right. So I'm going to do a, a search by keyword. So I can type in any word, and if that word appears in the question, then it'll be, it'll be shown. Now, my SQL statement, so I'm going to have two, pay, well, my SQL statement for my search is going to look something like this. Select star from poll where. Now, I don't want to require the user to get the text of the question exactly right, with everything spelled correctly and punctuated and spaced the same way. All right, that would kind of be ridiculous. Right? If you think of it uh, like if you do searches uh, in the in the library, you know. Um, you don't have to match exactly the whole title of a book. You can do a search for a title and just include a couple words on it, because maybe you don't remember the whole title. This is called an approximate search. All right. It would be like if there was a search for faculty people here on campus, and maybe you didn't remember exactly how Zellers was spelled. All right. A lot of people spell my name without the S on the end, so a lot of people spell it Z-E-L-L-E-R. And a lot of people spell it Z-E-L-L-A-R-S, or some variation of that. I might make an approximate search where I don't have to type in the full name, but I just type in the portion of the name that I know. Like, gee, I don't remember how you spell Zellers exactly, but I know it started Z-E-L-L. -L. So you type that in, and it will do a search, and it will find everyone whose name started with Z-E-L-L. -L. So it would find Zellers, it would find Zellman, and so on down the line. So that's called an approximate search. An approximate search, you use uh, the like operator. 
So I'm going to say select requested text like, and if I wanted to pick basketball, I would do something like this. Now notice in access, we use the asterisk. Actually, in other databases, you use a percent sign. That's a quirk of access. So that would find basketball anywhere in the question. That's what the star before and after means. If I had only a star after, that would find all the polls whose first word was basketball. All right, which probably isn't right. If I only had it like this, it would show all the polls who end with the word basketball. I probably want to find basketball anywhere in the question. doesn't matter if it's the first word, the last word, or somewhere in between. So therefore, I'm going to do this. So let's think about this page, what it's going to look like. It's always good to sort of sketch out in our mind what the page is going to look like. There is going to be a text box on the top of the page for our search word. There's going to be a button to go and do the search. And then there's going to be a grid view that is connected to the database that is going to show the results of the search. So let's go and create this page. Any questions about what we're going to do right now? What if, uh, I, I assume that we're doing a specific kind of search term now, and then would you show us um, how, uh, how we'd manipulate it so that a user would enter in their term. And then... Yeah, that's, what, that's actually what we're doing now. Okay. Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not going to hard code basketball in. We're uh, going to put a text box on the page that allow the user. Gotcha. Yeah, I, was just, I just use that as an example of what the SQL statement looks okay. like. All right, so let's go and create a new page. And I'm going to put on that page a text box. And I'm going to put on the page a button. I'm going to rename this guy. This is a, a little mini case of do what I say, not what I do. Um, it's not good to have a text box called text box one, because what does text box one mean? Take the 10 seconds to go in and rename it. So txt search will be the name of my text box and btn search will be the name of the button and I'll make the text of the button say search or I can even get fancy and say search by words in question. Again, the focus of this class is the programming aspect, right? But that doesn't mean forget everything you know about web design, all right? Take a few minutes to, to make the page look usable, all right? And make it look good and make it look usable. All right. So that is the text box where we're going to enter our search term in. 
I'm going to create a grid view. Why a grid view and not a details view? Right, exactly, because there could be more than one question. And I could use a detail view for it, and then there would be a number on the bottom of the page. It would say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But that doesn't seem to make as much sense as just making it a table of the results. And again, because I'm using a grid view, I need to get the data of the grid view from somewhere. Where am I getting the data of the grid view from? I'm getting it from a SQL data source. I'm going to configure the data source. What connection string do I want to use? I want to use a connection string that I put in the web config file. What does my SQL statement look like? Select star from poll where question text like Select star from poll where question text is like star plus question mark plus star. Notice the star is enclosed in quotes. We literally want that there, but the question mark is not enclosed in quotes. What does that mean? Well, so far in the previous example, we were just plopping in the ID right smack dab where the question mark was. But in this case, for the approximate search to work, we need the wild cards. We need the asterisks before and after our search term. So therefore, wherever our, our blank is going to be nestled between two asterisks. And that's what asterisk plus question mark plus asterisk means. All right? It means that whatever value gets plugged into the SQL statement, we want to surround it with asterisks. And again, the reason for that is we want to find this term wherever it is in the question text. It doesn't have to be in the beginning or, or the end. Now, we have to specify where that asterisk is coming from. This is just like the other example, right? Except in this case, the, the, the value that we're plugging in to the parameter is not coming from the query string. Where is it coming from? The text box. So we pick for parameter source. It's not a cookie. It's not a query string, blah, blah, blah. It's from a control. All right? A control is one of the fields that are on the page. And what's the name of the control is coming from? txt search. So what that is saying is take the value of txt search and plop it in for that question mark. So whatever I type in the text box is going to get plugged in when we do the query. And I can test it, which is a good idea to do, right? Because you may be sure that your query is right, and then when you run it, not get any results. All right? It's good if you can isolate and test a single thing at a time. All right, test one little piece of it at a time. That way, if something breaks, you have a pretty good idea what it might be and what it probably isn't. So if I run this test and the, the, the query gives me the right results, then the query's probably right. Well then, if it doesn't work, when I go to the web page, the problem is with something else. Maybe I forgot to bind the data to the grid view or something like that. So I'm going to run test, and I have to supply a test value. So I know energy is in one of the questions. So I'll type that in.
and I get nothing. to you about the asterisks. Maybe we do use a percent sign. We do. Okay. So, if this were like big budget TV, I would, I would hire some video editors to go over and every time I said asterisk for the past 20 minutes, um, have them overdub me saying percent sign, but I, I can't do that, so you do use a percent sign, all right? I was mistaken about that. Um, either they changed access or they something something has changed from when I did this previously or, or I was mistaken one of the two all right now this is actually good news that I found this at this place right could you imagine if I didn't test it and I assumed like oh I'm a hot shot I've been coding SQL for you know 75 years I, I know how to write a simple SQL statement like this and then it didn't work all right I might be looking at all sorts of things as why it didn't work where it was just something as simple as that so I click finish. <clears throat> Last step, of course, is to bind the data source to the visual control. And I should be good to go. So I'll make this guy the start page. And I'll test it. Search by words in question, energy. Click that. And I didn't spell it right. And there we go. All right. Now I have a question. I have a question. My default two page. I can click on a link and I can see that. All right. I can click on a link and see that. Could I make this page do the same thing? Could I make it if I do a search? That I could click on the question text and go to that other page. Yeah. yeah. Do I have to create a new page or could I reuse that other page? I could reuse it, right? That's the answer that we're hoping for, right? Because if we had to create another page, that would kind of stink. That, that wouldn't be good. And yes, we can absolutely reuse it. What would we have to do when we made this link to make it work with the other page? Okay, we changed something in the grid view to make a hyperlink field. All right. Let's, well, let's go and do it. Let's go and do it, and I'll ask questions when we get there. So, I'm going to go to this page. It looks like Access does use the asterisk, um, but in what you specifically are doing, use the percent sign. Yeah. 
I believe because the asterisk means one or more of all characters. The right. Percent is one or more, but is used as the first or last character okay. of like of something. So it gets confused when you use that because it could be anything. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah it, it's something along those lines. It, uh, it could be the fact that we're using a uh, a SQL object and the object is expecting an asterisk. Okay. So I want to turn this into a hyperlink field, and I want to link to my poll and answers page. So I'm going to go here. Again, the question always is, do I have to change the data source or do I have to change the visual? In this case, I am not retrieving any different data. I have all the data. I just want to format the data as a link. So that's... A, a, a grid view issue. So I'm going to go and edit columns. Question text. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to go and I'm going to create a hyperlink field. And I'll put that right there. Now with the hyperlink field, what are our fields that we have to put in. We have to put in the data navigate URL field. What is the data navigate URL field? That's a piece of data that we want to have in the URL. So what do we want to have in the URL? ID. The ID, the poll ID. So what's our data navigate URL format? In other words, where are we going to put that? Well, we know the page that we want to go to is called Poll and Answers. We know that. We just can't type it. All right. What's the rest going to look like? We need the question mark to say it's going to be on the query string. ID equals, ID equals curly bracket zero curly bracket. And I hope I typed, I did not type the right bracket. Okay. So, is it a coincidence that I picked the word ID here? No. That's what the catcher is expecting. Remember? Remember when we created that first page that linked to the second page. We had a pitcher and a catcher. And they had to speak the same language. They had to call the ID the same thing on the query string so that the pitcher could throw the ID to the catcher and the catcher could grab it. The catcher would know where to look for it. Same thing here. We're just having, we're just put, bringing in another pitcher. <laughs> all right? Bringing in a relief pitcher. All right? Now, in this case, as long as we match what the catcher is expecting, that catcher doesn't care. Did the ID come from page one or did the ID come from page two? We could have dozens of pages that all link to the same detail page as long as we follow the rules, as long as we put that ID for the poll where that second page is expecting it. And that second page is expecting it on a query string called ID. All right. Finally, we can say question text. And now when we run this, we can search. And we can click on it. Yeah, as long as this page is getting the ID where it gets it from, it doesn't care where it came from. You'll notice this like on a site like Amazon, right? Amazon, you can get to a product page a bunch of different ways, right? You could do a search for a product and click on it. Or you could be buying one product and it will say, 
here's some related items, and you could click on it. Or there might be feature item of the week that you click on, you get to a product page. So you can get to a product page a bunch of different ways, but you always end up with the same product. Why? How can you do that? Well, every page passes to that product page what it needs to pull up that product. All right? So it doesn't matter how you get there, as long as that second page gets what it needs to finish the transaction, you're in business. I'd like to do one more page today before we quit. I might go a couple minutes over, and I apologize, but I want to use a drop-down, all right, to do a search. So I want the list of the poll questions in a drop-down, and I want to be able to pick the list of que uh, the question from the drop-down, and I want to see the answers related to it. So my page is going to be drop-down, list of answers for it. This one eventually we're going to turn into the poll results page where you can choose a poll and it will show you what the voting is. We're not going to do all of that today, but we'll start along that track today. So let me go in here and create a new page. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, if you remember last time I had a problem when I used a master page, okay. so I just temporarily am not using the master and page. And I have the opposite problem okay. on my pages. Well, we, we can click that, it doesn't work. Okay. So I go and click, and I create the page. I'm going to create a couple of things. I'm going to create a drop down. Create a button. I'm going to create a grid view. Now we have to ask our question how many data sources we need. The drop down is going to contain what? A list of all the polls. All right? That's what the drop down contains. What is the grid view going to contain? It's going to contain the answers for the selected poll. All right? Those are two different things. The verbal descriptions are two different things. Therefore, we need two different data sources. So I'll go and I'll create SQL data source 1, SQL, SQL data source 2. So I'm going to configure this guy. Same thing, use a connection string. I'm going to create my SQL statement. I'll say select star from poll. Test query, there you go. Finish. Now I'm going to bind that to the dropdown. All right, I'm going to bind that to the dropdown. Choose data source. What data source? SQL data source 1. Now, we have to specify two things for a dropdown. Remember, there's always two things for a dropdown. There is what the user sees and what data there is sort of behind the scenes. All right? So, users aren't going to know what the poll ID is, right? Poll ID 12, what is that? Well, I don't know, all right? But they will recognize the poll based on the text. So I want to show for each poll ID, the field I want to display is the question text. Now the data field that I want behind the scenes of it is the poll ID. Because I'm going to use the poll ID in a parameterized query all right, to show the list of answers for that poll. So what the user sees, what is stored behind the scenes. So I click OK. Now for my second SQL data source, I'm going to configure it. I'm going to say select star from 
answer where poll ID equals what? Question mark. Where is that coming from? So drop down is a control. It's not the query string or any of these other things. And the name of the control that I'm interested in is drop down list one. Test query. There's an error. Answers. See, good thing I'm testing these, right? Save myself a lot of grief. All right. Now I'm going to make this guy the start page. And I can run this. What is your favorite energy drink? Very good. I didn't bind it. All right. See, when you're an old wily teacher as me, sometimes you make mistakes on purpose just to see if people are paying attention. I'm just joking about that. I, I literally forgot to find it. But here's the good news. I already tested that SQL statement. So I'm pretty confident the SQL statement works. So I can sort of check that off my list of problems. And if I didn't, if the SQL statement isn't there, well, then what is the problem? Oh, maybe it's not bound. So good eye. Had me worried there for a second. And it's bound to SQL 2. Now I run this. And I can pick. That was my first tip because it should have showed the first one. And as I go in and I pick, do you like Halloween? And search. Yes, no, maybe. What's your favorite energy drink? Red Bull Monster Kickstart. How could we get rid of the button? Pardon me? Well, what if I want to get rid of the button altogether? There's a thing on the drop down. Exactly. There's a thing on the drop down. And that thing is called auto post back. What that means is if you change the value of the drop down, it automatically sends it to the server. Because remember, if I didn't check that, it wouldn't work. Because I would change the value of the drop down, but it would never make it back to the server to re do the data unless there was a button to submit it or unless I define this as auto post back. So with this not checked, I go and run this. First time it's going to work. But if I go and change it, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because I've not gone back to the server to rerun the query. How do you get back to the server? Well, you have a submit button. That will send it back to the server. Or you make this guy an auto post back. You have to decide for your given project what makes sense. Does it make sense for it to be an auto post back or do you want them to hit a submit button? Usually, um, if there's like maybe one field in a drop down, I'll make it auto post back. If there's multiple fields, like you could choose a, a bunch of criteria, like when you search for a course here at LC, you could choose like the day of the week, the professor, the department, and so on. Then I would, I would have a submit button so you could pick all your choices and then do a search. All right.
any questions about this. All right, we'll see you on lab.